Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Actionable Ideas Conference Call. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for questions and comments following the presentation. If at any time you'd like to type a question in, it's at the lower left-hand side of your screen. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, President and CEO, David Dahl. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining us for Whittier's webinar on actionable ideas for real estate. We are living in a world of flux. The world is changing and it's dramatically impacting our health, our families, and our wealth. At Whittier, we are committed to our clients, their families, and our employees. I am proud of our team and the pivot we are making to webinars. Whittier's multifamily office and holistic approach to wealth management is bringing stability, reliability, and confidence to our clients. Two weeks ago, we discussed our outlook on the economy and financial markets. Last week, we reviewed opportunities to transfer wealth to your children, grandchildren, and intergenerationally. Today, we will discuss real estate and the opportunities we see in this strategic asset class. For over 100 years, we have purchased, managed, and transferred real estate. From our inception as an original developer of the city of Beverly Hills to being an investor in areas all across California, the West Coast, to Texas, Florida, Georgia, and along the eastern seaboard, real estate has played an important part in creating and increasing wealth for our clients. In today's market, you must not only have expertise in the acquisition of and the management of real estate, but you must understand the unique tax advantage that real estate provides. Depreciation lowers the tax due on rental income. 1031 exchanges allows for the deferral of capital gain taxes until there's a step up in basis. And the parent-child exemption allows for your children and grandchildren to receive your property tax basis. These advantages increase the wealth of owning real estate. Today is one of the unique opportunities in advantageous times to own real estate. Chuck Adams, Senior Vice President and Manager of our Real Estate Division, with Jorge Ramos will share some of our ideas with you. All of Whittier's advisors are available to discuss our unique approach to investing in and managing real estate. In addition to the client advisors, I want you to know that, I'm a pers that I am personally available to any of you. At the end of their comments, Chuck and Jorge will take questions. Thank you again for attending Whittier's webinar on actionable ideas. Chuck? Thank you, David. And I, too, want to welcome everyone here today that's dialed in. Uh, but David mentioned an interesting word, flux. And I, I couldn't agree more with the situation in real estate uh, being in flux right now. A couple of months ago, I really didn't expect to be having this kind of a webinar with everyone here today. And my go-to phrase at this time would be that we're experiencing fast-moving events in a typically slow-moving industry. And every day reiterates that. We're really maybe only two months into this pandemic. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a little slight issue. Anyway, we're maybe only two months into this pandemic and it hasn't progressed to the point where it's obvious that we're headed. I think uh, I've had many calls with our partners and other real estate firms whose principals have reached out just to touch base to see how we're looking at our client assets. And it's really amazing to me to see the level of cooperation among real estate firms that we never saw before. I think that the financial crisis of 2008 really started to prepare people for this type of an event and what not to do and repeat the same mistakes. People want an answer now, it's obvious, but we're really seeing a wait and see attitude from both buyers and sellers who are reluctant to commit. Deals will get done, we feel, but at the same time, they'll take a long time and they will change constantly during, the, during that process. But the one thing we keep in mind, and it's constant, is that real estate's been a core asset class here at Whittier, and we are open for business. I'd like to jump to slide three. And again, moving slow. 
So I apologize. But slide three is a picture of my second house, and I really appreciate how well the picture came out. So uh, that is one example of the largest asset class in the world. We move on to slide four. You know, this is a very simple slide. It'll tell how real estate really is the largest asset class in the world and how it dwarfs equities and bonds and over time has produced a very uh, excellent return. We go to page five. Sorry, this is lagging a bit. Uh, we drill down this slide, we can see a breakdown of the U.S. commercial real estate market. Once again, uh, this is a fairly simple look at the different segments of real estate and what make up the U.S. real estate market. For the last 10 years, approximately, this asset class has returned a 66% cumulative return. It also demonstrates the diversity of product type in the United States, and right now, not all these product types are healthy. Later in the slide presentation, we're going to show another slide that further drills down as to what assets are healthy now and which are suffering this quickly in the pandemic. The next slide page, on page six shows the recent activity at Whittier, and we'll get into a little more detail as we go forward. Over the last several years, we've purchased almost 2,000 units of multifamily properties, almost a million square feet of industrial property, and approximately 100,000 square feet of office space. In this chart here, you'll see, you'll not see retail, hospitality, or some of the more specialized product. We've deliberately avoided that, those asset types. You'll also notice in the map that we're working along the coasts of, of the United States, the warmer climates, and uh, with partners that have worked very actively in those areas. If we go to the next slide on page seven. You will see some of the activity that we've done over the last several years. I've already illustrated some of it. Um, but the one thing to keep in mind is in the last few years with these multifamily properties and industrial properties, we prefer warmer climates with solid infrastructure, better demographics, and personally for me, hopefully a top-end university. I think that's very important for our asset base. We also want to acquire assets that have had a good story at one point are just either poorly managed now or undermanaged and need some attention. Our sponsors are very good at sourcing these off-market and soft-marketed opportunities, and we have great relationships with these partners. I also want to point out a little bit of how we put our deals together. Uh, many smaller real estate companies that have grown over the past 10 years or so, or even longer, have funded their equity for deals with friends and family money. Uh, they, they find some type of property they like to buy, they'll call up everybody they know, and they'll raise some, some money. As part of their progression and growth, they want to do larger deals. And when they meet us, we often talk about how we can become the next level of friends and family for them. Uh, we can bring more investors to the table and equity to the deals. We're still able in this middle section between the very small friends and family deals and institutional investors to work in an area that isn't as picked over and as competitive as what the institutional buyers would do and what the real small deals would uh, show. We generally operate in that area and our programs are typically value add programs where we will have a very active hands-on uh, operator. It's typically a one-off single deal that we form an entity and uh, have many investors in it. 
Uh, after the, the value add program is completed, then we hopefully will sell to the more institutional groups. They often have someone like myself or Jorge who have been given large amounts of money either yearly or in a three-year cycle. And they, these folks, if they cannot buy real estate uh, and can't find deals that make sense, they'll have a tendency to stretch and it, because if they don't spend their money, they will lose it and have to be returned. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, this once again just reiterates what Whittier Trust does in real estate investing. We believe it's a, a core asset going forward and it historically has produced excellent returns. At this point, I'm going to ask Jorge Ramos to make some comments, drill down a little bit further into what we're seeing today in this market and the situation that we're all experiencing right now. So Jorge, would you please uh, make, have your comments? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'd also like to take this time um, opportunity to remind folks uh, to submit any questions they, they might have, and, and we will address those um, and answer any questions we have or receive at the end of the webinar. So um, as Chuck alluded, um, we're going to take a deeper dive into the current conditions. Um, so as you will see on this particular slide, this is slide number 10. There are several asset types that will actually have a positive impact um, as a result of social distancing. And as you can see, scanning from left to right, the more sensitive asset types are going to be or are um, starting with senior housing, retail, restaurants, and, and of course hospitality, including hotels and theaters. Um, Something we'd like to point out is we've intentionally avoided uh, retail, restaurants, and hospitality, and, and of course, we hold assets, as, as Chuck had mentioned, in multifamily and in, in industrial, and that's performed very well for us um, in the last few years. Um, moving on to the next slide, number 11. Um, we were presented with an opportunity to um, participate in a survey of real estate executives across uh, the country. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we really didn't foresee us participating, you know, in this environment, but the results are, are very interesting and sobering. Um, and based on this slide, you can see that industrial assets have really performed, or at least the idea is that they will perform very well and strong in this environment. Um, and we don't know how long this uncertainty will last, but it's also reflecting that multifamily as, long, as well as industrial will perform well, whereas retail and hospitality is considered um, to be one of those asset classes that will not perform well. Um, moving to the next slide, number 12. This is going to be an opportunity for, for me to present to you uh, the various challenges that our partners are facing with respect to day-to-day -day operations. Um, and the breakdown is is such that the first challenge that they have experienced or will continue to experience for an undetermined time is, is how to manage rent relief. I think it's important to make the distinction between rent deferral and rent abatement. Rent deferral implies that the rent um, that is due on a particular month will be partially paid or amortized for an undetermined period as long as the landlord or manager agrees. Uh, whereas rent abatement is really a forgiveness. If a landlord or a tenant, I'm sorry, or a landlord or an owner agree that rent abatement is to occur, then that rent is forgiven and is no longer obligated to, to be paid. Um, in our experience during this, you know, during this pandemic and, and current conditions, we haven't received many requests for rent forgiveness or abatement, but managers will continue to deal with the issue of rent relief. Um, we look to manage for cash flow and occupancy during these uncertain times, and our partners are managing these properties as prudently as possible. Um, they are following state and local mandates in areas with, that have called for eviction bans, and they continue to monitor rent collections on a weekly basis. 
Um, even though rents are typically due at the beginning of the month or the first week of the month uh, by the 5th, uh, during these uncertain times, it's weekly. We have calls with our partners reviewing those rent collections and the process and, and, and the rent requests. Um, another issue that property managers have been dealing with are, is the issue of how they respond to operations via rent um, facilities management. So with that said, you know, they, our partners are looking to maintain occupancy but have also looked to suspend all non-emergency related renovations or capital expenditures. Um, this is in turn looking to reduce move outs uh, by suspending non-emergency related renovations and capital projects. We're looking to create a positive effect on expenses and cash flow because less move outs would certainly mean less expenses for turnover um, and will likely result in higher occupancy through these uncertain times. Um, the last bit of you know, strategy that we can address is, is how our management teams and partners have relied on the current technology. Uh, they've used their technology to communicate with residents and they have the ability to email blast for marketing purposes so they, our partners are conducting business as best they can given the shelter in place and all the other mandates that are local and, and state um, mandated. So they can execute online renewals and even sign new leases electronically. They're also conducting business virtually. So if they need to show apartments, they can do that via their phone, via you know a tablet. So residents I've heard, or I'm sorry, prospects I've heard are even touring vacant units and model units with their phone uh, and have that ability to really see a product uh, in the multifamily space and even in, in the industrial space. Um, last thing I'd like to report is that our March rents that were realized in April were very strong. So, so we continue with business unusual, as usual. And uh, in conclusion, I'd like to hand it off over to, uh, to Chuck. Thank you, Jorge. I think that your last point is a really uh, important point in how fast things are moving. Uh, March rents, when they came in in April, were very strong, as Jorge alluded to. We were seeing 93, 95% collection. Now, April rents, when they come in in May, in the middle of May, that could be another story. It could be a little worse. It could be, could be fine. Uh, so I think that just reiterates what we've tried to make a point of is how fast these things are moving, the uncertainty, and how people are looking for uh, assurance when they can get it. It's tough to give, but I think it's really um, something that we need to, as a real estate department, stay on top of and make sure that our partners are doing what they're supposed to do and the management companies are doing what they're supposed to do. We, we spend a lot of our time, as Jorge said, uh, talking to our partners and our management companies because we don't want to be uh, not current with what is going on with the law uh, and we rely on our partners for that. Uh, we want to be able to get a relief when we can uh, for the programs that are available. And also just to uh, try to manage prudently and do health and safety repairs, but not necessarily the capital improvements and the more uh, cosmetic improvements we might have done in the past. So I think we might have a little bit of a, of a lag in some of our programs, but. I've, I've talked to our partners over the last three days, and they're cautiously optimistic at this point, but as they said, we're monitoring almost day to day. So it's something that uh, we're going to be doing going forward. And just on the conclusion page, I won't get into too much of it. We've hit on that already, and David touched on a bit of it. But I think the main thing is we oversee about a billion dollars of real estate assets for clients. And we have the capability to source opportunities going forward. Um, a lot of discussion about when that will happen. I've heard clients and friends say 8 to 12 months. I've heard you know, people talking to me right now about it's happening right now. There's going to be distressed opportunities. But at the same time, we have transactions going on right now that are really no change in, in the underwriting. So. Um, it remains to be seen, and I think this is just a, a time that uh, it's gotten on us so fast that hopefully 
uh, we'll be able to uh, keep ahead of it and uh, keep occupancy up and, and keep great asset value. So that's the conclusion of the presentation. Once again, I would remind everybody if you'd like to do a uh, have a question, be happy to try to answer that. Um, and we'll go from there. Jorge, hey, are there any questions we want to address? Yes, uh, we have several questions. So the first question we've received, um, and I'll just read them as number one, says, uh, you mentioned friends and family, dot, dot, dot. Uh, what level of equity do you suppose that is? Well, uh, for us, it's gotten larger over the last eight or nine years. Uh, probably in 2010, we were looking at raising smaller amounts just above the friends and family size of, of the smaller groups, maybe five million to seven million. Now we're capable of raising 10, 15, up to $20 million per deal. And it allows us to do a little bit bigger deals, but still stay out of the way of the, the big behemoth and in institutional investors. So I think it's still gonna be an area we like to um, operate in. And it shows, so far has shown us some great opportunities. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, next question, it says, should we be looking for new deals at this time and is there financing available? Yes, I think we should always be looking for new deals. I mentioned that uh, we are open for business, and uh, that really hasn't changed. Uh, we might have a little sharper pencil when we're looking at deals, but I still think we're going to be looking at industrial uh, deals and multifamily. Probably a little less on office because as everyone's starting to work from home, uh, at least temporarily, I, and have social distancing requirements, I think that will impact office. So we would probably consider that, but probably need to see how it shakes out a little bit going forward to get a better sense. Uh, I think uh, the timing of new investment opportunities will be uh, up in the air a little bit still. This is, I hate to always repeat myself, but it is so new in this process that we really see kind of day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week changes. So I think we're just gonna have to stay on top of it and try to be opportunistic when it, the opportunity arises. Okay, one more. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions and the one that just came in says, or is asking, how do you feel about retail that are essential services such as grocery stores like Dollar General, pharmacy like CVS or Walgreens? I personally look at uh, those types of assets uh, the way I always have. Uh, they're going to be essential, but the issue is that I've seen with some of the more triple net uh, retail, uh, uh, pharmacies, things like that, I think the issue is the age of them. When you buy these properties, you're really buying the longer lease. And over time, as that burns down, I think they become a little less valuable, um, especially if you're in an area where the demographics and development can move away from you. If you're, if you're in Maine and Maine and Santa Monica, you're probably going to be able to replace uh, the tenant if it were to leave. If you're out in the middle of the Midwest, development could move away from you to a brand new plan center, and you might be sitting there on a corner that is no longer as viable. So I think you really, on a case-by-case -case basis, have to determine the demographics of retail and, and pharmacies and the essential uh, companies. I think in conclusion, Chuck, we have one more, uh, one more question. Um, it says, as a subset of industrial, what has your experience been in warehouse since the pandemic came to the U.S.? Well, I've got about two months of experience, so I'm not uh, I'm not completely versed in it yet. But what I'm seeing is it's almost uh, like regular uh, market uh, with the values to be determined. The, the Good areas are less impacted. More remote areas are more impacted. Uh, supply and demand is always going to be critical. Critical location is always going to be important. Um, and I think industrial is just a 
it's always been looked at as kind of a paint and carpet business where you can adapt to a lot of different companies, a lot of different uses. Uh, I think it's uh, a lot more flexible than, say, retail, where you have to rejigger the building every time you lose a tenant to put a completely different look on it. Uh, office space that's older and more built out is always being reconfigured. I think that gets very expensive with the uh, tenant improvements. But I think the, the paint and carpet aspect of industrial is very appealing going forward, and I think location is everything, closer to the, to the coast, near the ports, uh, and uh, transportation. So I think uh, that just lends itself to, especially with Amazon and everyone getting involved in that part, I think it's going to be more of a, uh, uh, just having the right transit locations and being able to adapt your property. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, it seems like we don't have any more questions at this time. All right. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I know it was quick getting through this and had a couple of little technical glitches on the slides, but uh, we really appreciate you joining us, and we will look forward to uh, further questions. If you want to email me or Jorge or call us, we're happy to uh, answer your questions as needed. Uh, so thank you very much for attending today.